Hello folks and welcome to our Summer by the Sea event, a very special event sponsored by Coast Care, an event in which we're going to talk about the wonderful fossils around Port Phillip Bay and taking a special interest in those here in the Bo Morris and Mentone Cliffs. So I'd like to introduce you to Professor Emeritus John Buckridge on my right. How do you do? And Murray Orr who's the President of the Bayside Earth Science Society. There you go. All right. So firstly, I'd like to ask John to tell us something about the nature of these cliffs and why this area is so important. John, over to you. The rocks that form these cliffs are the Bomora sandstone and they were deposited around about 5.6 million years ago. Now you may think that 5.6 million years is a long time ago, but in fact, um, as far as the age of the Earth is concerned, they are, that's not so old at all because the Earth is around about 4.6 billion years. Nonetheless, 5.6 million years ago, this area was marine and in it were whales, turtles, many different sorts of fish, in particular sharks, as well as clams and other invertebrates living in the water. And it's these that are so exciting for us to find when they're worn out, weathered out of the cliff face. When we're talking about fossils that get washed out of the cliff, sometimes they, in fact, more often than not, they're going to be mollusks. And here's a typical bivalve or clam. And the shell of the clam is made up of calcium carbonate. Now this one uh, was taken out of the cliff face before it had a chance to be part of the, the sort of the, the eroding environment. As a consequence, the shell is all there still. But after a short period of time, when it does get worn out, here's another mollusk, this is a gastropod, we find that all the actual calcium carbonate has disappeared, it's gone. It's, it's quite a soft mineral. As a consequence, after a little while, this won't be recognisable really as much at all. However, with teeth, it's quite a different situation altogether. Now, when a tooth first comes out of the cliff face, they can look rather like this. And here is a, a tooth of a shark, and it's um, made up of this mineral we call apatite, which is significantly harder than the calcite. If it's lucky enough to be picked up quickly and go into a collection somewhere, it'll probably look a bit like this. But two things can happen to it. One, it can stay on the seafloor, perhaps lodged under or near a rock, and it gets covered in coralline algae. And this is an example of one that's been preserved, I suppose, by coralline algae. It's not moved around very much at all. And compare it with this one. I picked this one up literally about 10 meters away from where we are now. This one is highly worn and eroded. And in a short period of time, you won't recognize it as a tooth. So this has been in the cliff face for around about, in the rocks of the cliff face for around about 5.6 million years. It's come out, it's been eroded out, and probably only about 10 years, and it's like this, just weathered and tossed around by the waves. So that's the sequence of events. Every now and then we find something particularly exciting, and perhaps, Murray, um, you would tell us a little bit about one of the most exciting fossils that you've found here. Yeah, thanks John. Um, a good day on the beach. Um, I was uh, walking along uh, looking for um, some um, uh, sand dollars, which are um, a type of echinoid. And uh, it was a long day coming back. I uh, noticed something uh, just poking out under a rock. And it looked like the bottom rim of a, a Coca-Cola can or a lemonade can. And I thought, oh, I won't bother. Um, and then I realised that the rim of it had a bone-like surface to it. So, uh, reaching under the rock, I pulled out uh, what has become known as um, the Bomorris tooth, which is a whale tooth, a sperm whale tooth. Um, the whale uh, weighed about 40 tonnes. Um, it was about 18 metres long, uh, so the size of a small bus and uh, this particular tooth is about a third of a metre in length and weighs three kilograms. Um, the original tooth is now in the museum. Um, it comes to a point when you find something good on the beach uh, that 
uh, you realise that uh, it's, uh, it's too good to keep for yourself. So I gave it to the museum and they produced this, uh, this replica for me. It uh, was announced all around the world because prior to finding this, uh, the only um, uh, type of um, finds from this whale were in America, uh, California and um, uh, down uh, in South America and they were in strata which was about 12 million years old. Now this strata is about five to six million years old, so we brought it around the world and uh, uh, screaming through history uh, by many millions of years and um, we now have proof that this whale existed here at Bo Morris. And um, you too could find something like this. I'd encourage you if you did find something important um, to present it to the museum as a gift and uh, they will note uh, that you are the contributor and that goes down as part of its history so that um, in 200, 300 years time the person who is studying this perhaps at the museum um, they know that you actually donated it to the museum so um, uh, good luck in your in your searching and I hope you find uh, uh, the other one. There were about 40 of these in the whale's mouth and um, it's different to today's uh, sperm whales in that uh, these were in the upper and lower jaw and this whale fed on anything it felt like eating whereas today's sperm whales uh, have, jaw, uh, have teeth in the lower jaw only and uh, they feed by sucking in giant squid so a um, uh, very different uh, type of uh, uh, predation from this whale to the ones that are here today. Well, it's kind of interesting when we talk about whales because um, the killer whale is a very well-known animal and it's quite a large animal and here for comparison is a, a tooth from a killer whale and if we compare that with this one here now the killer whale also had teeth in the upper and lower jaws and we get an idea of the incredible size of this one here compared with today's living killer whales there are a lot of whale bones that you can find along the foreshore here and um, this is one. Um, you recognise it just looks like a piece of, of rock from the, um, from the cliff but this was found again on the foreshore and um, it has a sort of a grain in it like uh, you would see in, in timber and you can see that this has a depression around the edge. This is in fact an intervertebral disc. Um, if you've ever been to the chiropractor with a bad back uh, and he uh, starts pushing and prodding your back. Um, this is what a slip disc looks like. It slips out of place and um, you could say that this whale here has a very bad back and um, it really gives you a good description. Once you know the size of the vertebrae you can have a fair guess at the size of the whale. The other types of fossils which are fairly common on this foreshore are crabs and here's an example um, this is the underside of it which you can see the crab claws and as I turn it over on top uh, there's the top shell of the crab which have little sharp points on both ends and its arms coming around and and going underneath for its main front nippers. Um, these come in a variety of sizes the smallest one I found is probably a centimetre long and this would be one of the larger ones uh, that are around this foreshore but uh, the variety of fossils uh, that you find here is extraordinary and the other reason this site is important is that there's both land-based and sea-based animals found. Um, they have found parts of Diprotodon which is like a 500 kilogram wombat um, which would have roamed this area. Uh, they've found um, uh, parts of uh, seal and penguin and the penguins were almost the size of the uh, large uh, emperor penguins in the Antarctic. This bay uh, used to extend inland quite some kilometres and over the millions of years has been filled in um, and the sandstone has developed and then been thrust up out of the rock and it's what is eroding uh, into the water uh, that releases fossils like this. Well, one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that we've talked about the invertebrates, in other words, the things like mollusks and echinoderms and things, and there are some beautiful examples of 
echinoderm that are found here. This is a thing called Lavinia, which is particularly common. And in fact, this is the type location of Lavinia woodsi. Now this thing here is extremely common in the rocks around the foreshore here when they're worn out. And, uh, it's a sea urchin, is it John? It is a sea urchin or sea egg. Now, um, one thing that is here that's perhaps rather intriguing is that we haven't mentioned plants. And there are not fossil plants on the whole, but there are tree trunks, extensive tree trunks that, are, that were washed out as um, uh, during floods, a tree would be washed down a stream and would have settled and become waterlogged in the beach, sands and muds, and they sink to the bottom of the ocean. And over a period of time, they are compressed and their outline, effectively, their structure or their shape is left behind. But that's the only thing that remains. And these molds or casts of trees are remarkably common around here. Once you get your eye in, you can see that you walk along a stretch of the beach in the Beaumaris sandstone and you will see the impression of a large tree. On rare, and I say that specifically, rare occasions we can find the remains of plants, land plants, as well as this wide plethora of land animals and marine animals. So it is one of the most significant and important fossil locations in Australia. We're now going to walk around the Beaumaris Yacht Club, the Beaumaris uh, Motor Yacht Squadron and past the jetties and things to a very special little beach, much safer for you and your children if you come down. It's called Fossil Beach and we'll have a little chat about some of the fossils there as we wind up this session. So join us for the walk. The wee birds so all live in there. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Yeah. Now, what's really interesting about this car park is that probably underneath the car park are the remains of probably large animals that were living here, maybe skeletal remains. Who knows what's beneath this car park? Uh, There's a baby Pacific gull. Yeah. A lovely baby Pacific gull there. I love them. It's in right on the end. Mum's left it and gone looking for food. Yeah. Right off every post here has a bear on it. What's, what's important here is the fact that the sea is eroding. If we compare this rock outcrop with what we may find in Central Australia, for example, even though the rocks are um, perhaps very, very fossiliferous, the sea actually cleans the cliff face and cleans the fossils. And it's a, the active erosional process that brings stuff out. Uh, and in a way, it, it's a two-edged sword. It's eroding, it's making fossils come out on the, on the foreshore, but it's also ultimately just destroying them. Yeah. And uh, that's why it's important. If you see something that's really useful, interesting at least, it's, it's worthwhile picking it up and conserving it. The other important thing is we're the last generation, in my view, that will um, be able to collect here without uh, scuba diving, because at the rate of uh, the uh, rise in seawater, um, the difference between high and low, low tide here is probably less than half a metre. Mm. So uh, with the rise in sea levels, this site will be inundated mm. by the end of our lifetime. Yeah. Not a worry for climate change. Yeah. Uh, th this sign is something that uh, both DELP and Bayside Council uh, worked with us on uh, uh, to produce and uh, just gives you a demonstration of what you can find on the foreshore and uh, also the uh, warnings from Bayside and DELP as to uh, the penalties for digging on the beach. One important thing we want to tell you before you go finding fossils is that you need to wear the correct footwear. These small rocks behind me on the foreshore are slippery, particularly in summer when the algae grows on them. So thongs are no good. Uh, you want 
proper sandals or um, uh, waterproof boots. Um, again, don't stand under the cliffs uh, because if one of those rocks falls, it will kill you. So stand back from the cliffs, even if you think you've found a good spot to look for fossils, don't go in too close to the cliffs. Um, there's blurring octopus everywhere in Port Phillip Bay, particularly in rocky areas, so don't put your hand into a hollow that you can't see. Uh, if lightning starts, get off the beach. And that's a general rule even if you're swimming. Don't stand on the beach when there's lightning. Um, and the other thing that very occasionally there can be a freak wave. So you've heard about fishermen getting uh, washed off the rocks. That can happen here too. So take it easy, take a lot of care. Um, wear a hat and slip slop slap. One of the most common fossils around here is the Lavinia woodzine. Here's quite a nice specimen here on this fossil beach. And we can see that it's, it is a remarkably well preserved specimen indeed. So this little fellow here, Lavinia woodzine, burrowed into the sand at the bottom of the ocean down to perhaps five centimetres or so, and it would come out at high tide. So it was, it was a, a fossica for food, and uh, they also called sea mice because when they were alive, they had numerous fine um, spines over the entire body. So they looked like, a bit like a little mouse. John, is that a fossil? It looks like something's hip -clown. Ah, no, no, this is a, a, a nodule of phosphate. Okay. Now, it's, um, it's actually quite important because these phosphate nodules only form during periods of quiescence or low sediment input, so it would have been a relatively stable environment with hardly any sediment coming into it, oh, yeah. and it would have been shallow, warm waters. So this is a phosphate nodule, and there are many, many of these in certain horizons. It was an amateur fossil hunter who dug this hole. He's since been identified, and the Bayside Council and uh, together with DELP have made this area stable. Uh, but this shows you what you shouldn't be doing. Um, you should not be digging into the cliff and destroying the cliff. They, they closed the beach for several months while that was being done, and destruction like that could cause the closure of all beaches in Victoria. It also shows that the person digging doesn't understand this area because all you're likely to find in here are degraded shells. The fossil beds that are yielding the most fossils are out under the water and they're washing in onto the foreshore. Okay, um, thanks for coming here today. Hope you've had a, uh, an informative event. Uh, hope to see you down here sometime. Uh, we're, uh, we're always uh, on the beach, or some of us are on the beach at most sunny days and at low tide. So uh, thank you and um, see you soon. And remember, except for the odd loose fossil you may find lying around in the sand strand at the bottom of the cliff face, take nothing away from the beach except photographs and leave nothing behind but your footprints. It's great seeing you here. Thanks.